On July 12, 1979, a disc jockey and the son of an MLB owner combined their powers for what was supposed to be a fun and harmless promotional event. And then this happened. I hope they don't let you people see what's going on here at Comiskey Park. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen in a ballpark in my life. We've got the greatest country in the world, but you know what? We have become followers. So many people, insecure, don't know what to do with themselves and how to have a good time. They follow someone who's a jerk. There are now, I'd say, 10,000 people on that field, Bill, without any question. I'd rather swim or I'd rather do a lot of other things than just stand on a baseball field. A meaningless game in July between two teams under 500 ended when 10,000 of Chicago's angriest youth stormed the field. They made fires, they made explosions, and a couple of them even made babies. But how did this harmless promotion end with multiple injuries, dozens of arrests, the death of an entire music genre, and decades of criticism claiming that what was supposed to be a harmless joke was actually a targeted attack based in racism and homophobia? This is the story of the best and worst promotional event of all time. The year was 1979, and America was enduring the most challenging conflict in its history. The country was strongly divided into two factions, rock and roll and disco. The man in the center of this controversy was none other than the Chicago radio personality, Steve Dahl. This guy hated disco more than anything in the world, and it all started six months earlier when the rock station he worked for fired him and switched to disco. Dahl quickly got a new job, but was still so bitter, he began a full-out assault on everything disco and he did it by acting like a complete psycho. Chicago, which is known for its long history of street violence, had a new street gang. But this one didn't sell drugs, launder money, or kill its rivals. This one was more interested in killing an entire music genre. Dahl called his gang the insane Coho Lips. He was the commander, and the thousands of kids who listened to him joined the army and treated him like a savior. He held anti-disco events where he dressed up like a soldier, got on stage, and smashed disco records over his head. The kids loved it. These events were so huge, at one point, over 2,500 people came to a bar to watch Dahl's performance. The crowd was so out of control, riot police showed up with German shepherds and shut the whole thing down. Mike Veck, the president of the White Sox, saw this and thought, hey, we should do this at one of our games. What could go wrong? Turns out, everything could go wrong. But in all honesty, the idea that anybody would show up to a Chicago White Sox game in 1979 was so foreign, a riot really didn't seem possible. The team brought in about 10,000 fans per game, so even if the promotion was successful and doubled the size of their crowd, they would only have around 20,000 people in a stadium that fit 50,000, which is nothing a few dozen security guards can't handle. So Dahl came up with his master plan. Everyone who showed up to the first game of the doubleheader with a disco record would get in for 98 cents. They would put these records in a box, attach dynamite to it, and in between games, Steve Dahl would detonate the records in center field. The plan would help bring exposure to Steve Dahl, his radio station, help the White Sox with their attendance woes, and kill Disco once and for all. The two sides agreed. The plan was bulletproof. Nothing could go wrong. So on July 12, 1979, the Disco demolition began. Here's LaFleur to lead it off. First pitch of slider strike. You could tell during the National Anthem that this game would probably not be a normal one. Who's got stripes and bright stars? This performance was later interrupted when a fan yelled out a homophobic slur. But this would not be the most vulgar thing done that night, and it wouldn't be the last singing performance either. As the fans piled in, they were wearing ripped jeans, hung vulgar signs on the rafters, and apparently made the entire stadium smell like marijuana. So if you ever wonder why a ticket and a beer cost so much at a baseball game, it's probably because they don't want people like this showing up. But the first few innings were relatively calm. Play was constantly stopped because fans kept throwing toilet paper on the field, and if that happened today, the MLB would immediately stop play, call in the National Guard and escort players to an underground bunker. But the rules in 1979 seemed a lot more relaxed. I mean, the players just shoved it off to the corner and kept playing. Early on, it was obvious this was not a normal crowd. There was definitely more people in the stadium than usual. However, the crowd really didn't arrive until the later innings. And in the fifth inning, an announcer even said this. There's a lot of folks outside and there's still room, so we would like to see anybody come down if they want to. Yeah, he probably regretted saying this because what he didn't realize is that crowd of people outside was way more than anybody ever imagined would show up. And they showed up late for a reason. They were not there to watch a baseball game. They were there to explode disco records and get drunk while doing it. 
When they realized too many people came to the game, they stopped letting people in, but most people didn't care. They used ladders to climb into the upper deck from the street, and by the end of the game there were 67,000 people in a stadium that only sat 50,000. And a large amount of this attendance snuck into the upper deck, which was literally shaking because it was so crowded. This caused real concern that it could collapse, but again, it was 1979, so still not enough concern to do anything about it. The only rule the promoters had going into the event was to not give the fans anything they could throw in the field, but when the amount of records collected became so overwhelming, they just stopped collecting them at the gate and just let the fans in without handing over anything. Well it turns out records just might be the perfect thing to throw on a field. So instead of blowing up their disco records, fans just started using them as frisbees. But flying records weren't even the player's biggest concern. As the game went on, fans reportedly threw golf balls on the field, lit fireworks, and shot firecrackers at the players. He has fanned twice against Underwood. I just thing. wonder, I see him, he sits around. Was taken to Illinois Masonic Hospital for extra. The catcher just refused to catch anymore. He almost got hit with a firecracker, Harry. It went right over his head and he just refused not to get on there anymore. And the chaos didn't stop there. As more rockers entered the stadium, the food vendors became overwhelmed. Their peanuts and Cracker Jacks were stolen and they couldn't do anything about it. One vendor even had to leave the game early with a broken hip. But perhaps the biggest victim in all this was Lorelai. She worked for the radio station promoting the event and was forced into kissing this gross looking guy. Listen, I told my boys who are 16 and 14, I gotta give you a kiss. Ah, it's good to see you. you Jimmy Pearsall, who was announcing this game, was a little old school. He hated every single aspect of this promotion and made it perfectly clear from the very start. What kind of music do they play? Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Well, they won't get my boy. They can blow up their, their records too. They got a champ here. I don't want to turn it down. Listen here, that Three, two, pitch. Pull. Listen to the crowd. I can't make out what they're jamming. Oh, I can't, but I won't tell you. Because it's bad for your ears. Ceases to be funny when someone might get hurt. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen in a ballpark in my life. Pearsall, however, had zero problem when his broadcast partner said this. Did he get arrested for molesting a, se a senior citizen? <laughs> That bizarre quote came from the legendary Harry Carey, who was also in the booth that night and had the complete opposite reaction to the fanfare. He absolutely loved the chaos and enjoyed every second of it. Well, we're going to have a wonderful crowd. Without a question, the greatest teenage promotion night that any station has had by far. This place is jammed. Look at it. Like this. Unfortunately, the fun-loving spirit of the great Harry Carey was not present throughout the stadium. Tens of thousands of fans anxiously waited for their fearless leader, Steve Dahl, to enter the park and start the disco demolition once and for all. Some of the fans filled with more anger than others, and when the hometown White Sox eventually lost 4-1, to one, that anger multiplied. Actually, not really. Nobody really cared whether the White Sox won or not. The important part was, the game had ended and the real chaos was about to begin. Following the game, Steve Dahl, the guy everybody in the stadium came to see, put on his army uniform, strapped on a helmet, got in a jeep, and drove around the field. And what did the crowd do? They threw beer, records, and anything they could get their hands on directly at him. And remember, this is the guy that they liked. But Dahl didn't care at all. He later said that having fans throw things at him was a rush and extremely gratifying. Steve Dahl, fueled by his hatred of disco and pumped up from being targeted by projectile objects, went to center field, grabbed a microphone, and began preaching to his army. The Supreme Commander, Steve Dahl! Party! Us rock and rollers here in Chicago think disco sucks! Disco sucks! Cause I spent so much time blow drying out my hair. After his speech, he did what everybody came to see. He exploded a giant box filled with disco records. One, two, three, boom! Yeah! And that was it. The disco demolition was complete. Time to start the second game, right? 
Well, that was the plan, but even as belligerent as the fans were inside, all the fans who were not admitted into the game because of capacity issues were on the street having their own demolition. Security left the field to adjust the riot happening outside, giving the fans inside the perfect opportunity to destroy not only disco, but an entire stadium as well. So minutes before the second game was set to start, as the White Sox starting pitcher was warming up on the field because he was too scared to pitch in the bullpen, which was well within Firecracker and Disco record range, a few fans ran onto the field. Then a few more ran onto the field. A few minutes later, 10,000 fans ran onto the field. These kids were out of control. The fans stole the bases, dug out the turf, set a fire on the field, stole the batting cage, set that on fire, climbed the foul poles, ran into the dugouts, a few even infiltrated the clubhouse, and a couple was even seen having sex behind second base. So wow, yeah, Disco must really suck. And despite all this chaos, the White Sox were still planning on playing the second game. They made several attempts to get the fans off of the field, they made a couple announcements on the PA system, and even put a message on the Jumbotron. Yeah, I don't know how that didn't work either. At this point, the White Sox owner, Bill Veck, had had enough. Bill Veck is the father of Mike Veck, who was the mastermind behind this whole promotion, and Bill himself is basically the king of this kind of stuff. He was the one who came up with the idea of putting Ivy in the Wrigley Field outfield, once had a player who was 3'7 play on his team, and even let the fans make all the managerial decisions for an entire game. Bill was the only one who seemed worried that this promotion could get out of hand, so he checked himself out of the hospital earlier that day to make sure it didn't. And when he realized his nightmare was coming true, he hobbled onto the field with his wooden leg and tried to settle everybody down. All right, let's clear the field. Please clear the field so the ball fans can see again. Let's clear the field. This is Bill Beck. Please clear the park. Please clear the field. Back to your seats! Good try, Bill. He did this for over 30 minutes. And when they realized this plan may not work, Harry Carey grabbed a microphone. And while 10,000 fans set fires and rioted on a baseball field that was completely destroyed, he and Bill Veck performed a duet of Take Me Out to the Ball Game that may go down as the most poetic moment in sports history. And as beautiful as that performance was, it turns out riot police are a lot more effective. The police came and within minutes the crowd was cleared. 39 people were arrested and 6 were injured. Time for the second game, right? Well, at least that's what the White Sox said. Yeah, the field looked like Normandy, there was a fire in center field, and the bases were stolen. But the White Sox still wanted to play. Unfortunately for them, Sparky Anderson and the umpires decided otherwise, and the White Sox would have to forfeit. The disco demolition was officially over, but the controversy surrounding the event had just begun. Soon after the event, Dave Marsh of the Rolling Stone wrote that this event was filled with people who saw disco as the product of homosexuals, blacks, and latins, and participated to wipe out such threats to their security. And although Steve Dahl's motivation seems to be based on the popularity of the music causing him to lose his job, some of his fans' motivation may have been a lot less innocent. Chicago is known for being one of the most segregated cities in the country, and the area surrounding their stadium had many problems during this era. Thad Bosley, who played outfield for the White Sox, one time had his car surrounded by a mob after a game. And Vince Lawrence, who worked at the stadium and went on to have a music career of his own, was racially targeted and jumped near the ballpark as well. Lawrence worked as an usher that night and says that many of the records he collected weren't disco records, but records made by other black artists. And being one of the few black people in the stadium that day, many went out of their way to tell him specifically how much disco sucks, despite him wearing a shirt of the rock station doing the promotion. It seems as though many people participating in this riot weren't exactly the most welcoming crowd. This narrative became more relevant over time, but most of the criticism surrounding the event in 1979 was focused on the extreme lack of precaution taken by Steve Dahl and the White Sox. Mike Veck lost his job and wouldn't get another in Major League Baseball for 10 years. But for Steve Dahl, the night could not have gone better. He and his radio show grew in popularity, eventually allowing him to have his own TV show. He is still on the radio today. And maybe the biggest accomplishment? He actually killed Disco. 
In 1979, a disco record was number one on the music charts for 37 out of 52 weeks, but only one of those 37 weeks occurred after the demolition. And the year following, the Grammys canceled their best disco recording category altogether. The disco demolition worked so well, it turned into a disaster, which may make it one of the most successful promotions ever. And also, one the MLB would like you to forget. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe, and I actually kind of like some of the disco songs, to be honest. I had to chase two boys out of my hall that was urinating in it. And also, we had a car on the curb by our, by our house. Have you ever had anything like this? Uh, we had it last year when they had a disco going on here. We're all constantly cleaning our halls and our our streets here with beer cans from these people coming here. We got a nice neighborhood, and this is our livelihood right here. We live here. We keep it clean.